beam deflections again. Uh, this time we will be using superposition to determine beam deflections. This makes use of the principal superposition. And again, we've discussed this before, but fundamentally, superposition allows us to take multiple loads on a structure and determine separately the effects of these different loads and then combine the results. Of course, this only applies when we have load deformation relationships that are linear and also deformations that are small. For this beams, that are subjected to several loads. Of course, we can break those loads up into various cases, look up the information and in tables, and then add the contribution from the various loadings. The tables are typically found in various different handbooks. The tables we're going to use for our work are found in Appendix C. We're going to demonstrate this approach using two examples. The first one is a cantilever beam subjected to a concentrated load and a concentrated moment. The beam is a W8 by 48. As we discussed before, the W stands for wide flange. The 8 is the depth, nominal depth of this beam, roughly 8 inches, and the 48 is the weight per foot of beam. We could also include this in the calculations of deflection for this case, but we're going to skip that. We're going to just look at the contribution from the 1.2 kip and the 2 kip foot. We need to determine the displacement at point A in this case, and that is going to come from those two cases. And let's look at the two. So this is what we need. We need a deflection. And so of course, this is going to come from two cases. Using the principal superposition, we'll have that plus that case. Let's add some loading. So in the first case, we got the 1.2 kip loading. In the second case, we have the moment, the 2 kip foot moment. And so the displacements in these two cases, the first one is pretty simple. It's just the displacement cost by the force. The second case is a bit more complicated. We need to break this up into two. This first portion is going to deflect as a straight line. There's no force acting on it. And the second portion, curve. So we can find the contribution. Let's call this 2-1 to the deflection up to the midpoint by using the equation for deflection. And then the second portion, this portion, we need to find using the rotation, theta, and this length, L, that length. And so this will be L times theta. So the total displacement, delta 2, is going to be equal to the displacement, delta 2, 1, plus the rotation times the length. The cases we're looking at, so for the first case, our displacement is going to be equal to PL cubed over 3i. For the second case, and the first case, by the way, the L is 16 feet in the second case, the L is going to be 8 feet for the displacement and then 8 feet for the rotation as well. And so we'll use that theta max in here to compute the displacement for the second portion. Notice also that the beams in the table are essentially a mirror image of the given beam. That doesn't matter. Uh, we can do this because we're looking at the displacement at the end, the far end. So the fact that we have a mirror image of the given table uh, displacements shouldn't affect the result. The total displacement at A then is going to be equal to the displacement 1 plus the displacement 2. And the displacement 2 is equal to delta 2, 1 plus L times theta. Displacement 1 is going to be negative PL cubed over 3i. And the displacement 2 is going to be, so it's going to be negative as well because it's pushing the beam downward. MO L square over 2ei. And then finally, the length. So this is a different length. Let's call length 1 minus length 1 times theta, which is m not l1 over ei. If we substitute the values for e and i, e for this case is going to be 29,000 ksi. Also have to look up the moment of inertia for this case. 